Welcome to the Ride Chair Guy podcast, where you will learn about the ride chair and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years' experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Nick Katz is head of development at Cover. He spent most of his career building relationships and making partnerships in and around the gig economy. When he first moved to San Francisco, he built out an on-demand workforce for event staffing, ultimately taking his learnings to Eventbrite, where he managed the marketing team's contractor relations. Along the way, he's worked in just about every major gig marketplace from Uber to Wonolo to Upwork. Today, he's leading development at Cover, a new benefits provider for gig workers fo focused on delivering a financial safety net that will replace lost income income during emergencies. So really excited to chat with him today because obviously benefits are very topical right now in the rideshare and I guess gig world at large. So Nick, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited. How you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, you know, I know we had a couple uh, AV issues, but luckily you and I both powered through them. I've been doing this podcast and, you know, the whole business for six years, so I should have it all worked out by now. There's no real, real excuse for me, but, you know, things come up, right? <laughs> yeah. The key thing is, is that you uh, keep moving once things do come up and you don't stop. So. All right. Well, here we are, and I'm excited to chat with you about Cover, about what's going on in the industry right now with benefits, because um, it's a big topic. So I guess, I guess at, a, at a high level, um, well, I did have one question for you first, and it would be really awkward if I've been saying this wrong the whole time. Is it Cover or is it Cover? Because uh, I, I thought about that about like halfway into, you know, I did, I know you guys did a, a couple podcast sponsors, sponsorships and we were doing some projects and I was like, wait, how do you say the name of this company? <laughs> yeah. So we started the name as it was supposed to be cover.ai. Okay. Uh, pronounced like cover. But after talking to something like 100 customers and 98 of them pronouncing it cover. Mm -hmm. We decided that we were just going to lean in mm -hmm. and take the name Cover. It's also a little bit more, it enables us to say stuff like Cover's got you covered, which gotcha. if you say Cover's got you covered, that sounds kind of weird. Yeah. So. yeah. And I mean, obviously, if you guys are going to be a real tech company, you have to at least master a few of the, the puns, right? <laughs> Exactly. Cool. So why don't you give me the quick pitch, you know, before we get into all the benefits talk and all that, I kind of want to set the stage uh, about Cover. You know, I mentioned a couple times now on the podcast um, and uh, on the last couple interviews, you know, I know you guys uh, started sponsoring the show when we interviewed uh, Uber's CEO. So that was a good one to start on. And uh, why don't you give me the quick pitch on what uh, Cover does just for those who may not have heard it? Yeah, definitely. So Cover is an income protection product. Basically what that means is if you get into an accident, you get hospitalized, or even if you get deactivated off the platform that you're using, mm -hmm. Cover replaces the income that you would have earned while you're dealing with this crisis. And so what we found is that most gig workers, they don't have these types of protections. You get, you end up in a hospital, not only do you have your healthcare costs, but you also have your regular bills yeah. and you don't have money coming in. So we just we help you bridge that gap and we try to prevent you from entering into a debt spiral. Got it. So it's like you mentioned, it's focused, I guess, on the income, but not necessarily the medical bills or the healthcare side of things, right? Correct. Yeah. We just replace lost income. We're not, uh, we're not an insurance provider. We don't come in and take care of medical bills or healthcare costs or accident repairs or anything along those lines. It's just income replacement, similar to if you worked at a W-2 job and you were sick for a week, mm -hmm. they'd still pay your salary. Right. Um, so what, what are the situations, I guess, when that uh, income uh, protection would come into play? Or I guess the main ones, or is there a limit to uh, the, the, the situations? Yeah, so we cover three primary um, situations. Mm -hmm. The first being if, you, if you're in an accident, your car needs to be repaired, and you're in, you know, you rely on your car for income, mm -hmm. we cover your income while the car is in the shop. Mm -hmm. The second one is if you end up in the hospital, we cover your income while you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then the third is deactivations. And this is one that we're really excited about because I don't know how many times you've seen this, but I've seen this at least a thousand times. Yeah. Uber drivers complaining that they were wrongfully deactivated. We actually partner with Legal Rideshare mm -hmm. to offer a full service solution where not only do we cover your income while you're deactivated, we also send a letter send a letter to the platform that deactivated you 
requesting that they reactivate you or at least provide some evidence as to why you were um, deactivated. Got it. Yeah, and I think it actually was uh, pretty fitting since the ambulance uh, drove by right when you were talking about accidents and hospitals. And so someone's going, unfortunately, you know, ho hopefully not too serious, but someone might be going to the hospital right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting. And so what, uh, for, I, I guess you obviously have yourself a lot of experience in the gig economy, and this is a pretty robust product. I guess I would even say I was kind of surprised that it's just focusing on gig workers and Uber and Lyft drivers. It's definitely, you know, I totally agree with you that it's a big need. What are the kind of origins behind the company's founding and kind of why, um, did you guys at Cover decide to kind of go after this, uh, you know, I guess niche or vertical, or maybe you looked at others. I'm just curious about kind of like what the impetus for it all was. Yeah, so uh, about two years ago, our CEO, Zach, had this idea of a, a risk-sharing platform, basically, mm -hmm. where like-minded individuals could pool resources and um, cover each other in the events of niche is the perfect term for it, niche risk. Got it. So um, typically, you don't have... Uh, there's no services out there for it because mm -hmm. these niche risks are relatively small market cap. Mm -hmm. um, you're not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, so there's not a lot of development service. So we built this platform to enable us to go after many niche verticals. Uh, and we'll get to that 200, 300, 400 million dollar market cap eventually, by, but by focusing on a bunch of these, you know, 10 to 20 million dollar verticals. And Gig just made a lot of sense because everyone in the gig space, and I know this personally from being a gig worker, mm -hmm. everyone in the gig space is feeling the pains of the lack of sustainability mm -hmm. when it comes to suffering an emergency or suffering a crisis. I, I remember one year when my, I was in a car accident and it was the week before Thanksgiving and I was supposed to, you know, like go home and enjoy Thanksgiving. And then I was going to go home for Christmas, enjoy Christmas with the family. But because I was in a car accident and I couldn't drive my car for, you know, first off, I couldn't drive my car home, yeah. but I couldn't drive my car for two weeks afterwards. I was so far behind on my bills and on my rent and everything else that I had to work the entire month of December without taking a day off, mm -hmm. had to work Christmas, had to work New Year's and New Year's Eve. And I still ended up in debt, uh, in a debt that took me about a year and a half to pay off just because... Yeah. It, it's so hard to stay on top of everything. And when you have one of these emergencies that just knock you so far back, it just becomes not only are you trying to stay on top of things, but you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole. And we wanted, we really wanted to help people that are suffering from. Yeah those types of circumstances. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And obviously, you know, I think when I first heard about the service, it definitely solves a major, you know, if not multiple major point pain points for drivers and gig workers. And, you know, I think that it's, it's tough because like, these are the types of products and I guess services, like I almost think about it, like this is like the, the good and the bad about working in the gig economy. The good is that like you actually have the ability, you know, to like go out and drive all of December, right? If I look at it, like how glass has full, you know, in a normal job where you're limited to, let's say 40 hours a week, it might be difficult to get additional shifts, for example, or if you normally work 20, it's hard to go up to 40, right? You have that in the gig economy, that flexibility that drivers are always talking about. But the downside, of course, is that let's say you do get injured, or you get into a car accident, then you're basically on your own. And if you haven't been preparing and sort of getting ready, uh, then you're sort of screwed. You're kind of, you know, kind of in a really tough spot. And I feel like most drivers, unfortunately, you know, do fall into that camp, frankly, when you're only making 15 to 20 bucks an hour, right? Is that kind of, what, what do you think the average driver or, you know, how, how prepared do you think they are for like the services or the situations that Cover might offer? Yeah, I, I'm the average driver from the research we've done, the average drivers typically have around a thousand dollars in their account for a rainy day savings fund, mm -hmm. which seems like a lot of money. But when you think about, you know, the fact that the average driver is earning somewhere between 800 to $1,200 a week, mm -hmm. if you're out of commission for a week, that rainy day savings fund is gone immediately. And so that doesn't even cover what other costs you might have. If you have a $500 deductible, plus you're out of commission for a week, yeah. all of a sudden your costs are up to two, $3,000. And you still need to pay rent. You still need to buy food. Most of our customers have kids that they 
have thousands of dollars worth of expenses for every month when it comes to kids. So, um, yeah, kids are, are expensive and uh, loud. If anyone here is crying in the background, you know what that is. Um, so are most of your customers uh, full time or part time? Uh, so up until this month, we were almost 100 percent full time mm -hmm. customers. This month, we actually started getting a handful of part time customers, and that's um, in large part because of a partnership we have with a friend of yours, uh, Dylan over at Rideshare Hub. He's been um, talking about us a lot to his community, and cool. uh, we were able to generate some interest from, from some part-time customers, but for the most part, yeah, it's mostly full-time customers. Got it. Because, I mean, I guess the product kind of tends to, that you guys are offering sort of, well, I mean, everyone might need help actually with some of the deactivation services and the income replacement and all that, but uh, it might be more meaningful to full-time drivers. But I guess the more I think about it, I mean, I think it's still relevant to both full-time and part-time. Maybe just the messaging or the features that they care about are a little different, right? Yeah. Um, I think you you hit it on the head with that one the part-time drivers really care the most about deactivation yep. because they have other incomes. They are not dependent on their gig income in order to pay bills. It's typically money that they're looking to set aside for a vacation or something that's not going to, they don't have this circumstance where if they are out of commission, then they, you know, going into a debt spiral or dealing with any type of a financial yeah. risk. Uh, but, when they get deactivated, that's their play money. That's their, you know, that's their vacation money or whatever it is that their side hustle is saving up towards. And so that's where most of the part-time drivers have been interested in our deactivation services. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so part-time drivers are interested in deactivation services. What is the, I guess, maybe, I guess, full-time, um, what are they, like, why are they coming, why, why are they signing up for Cover and the results you've seen or just more generally with your customers? Well, like, what's the, what's the one thing that kind of keeps coming up? It's like, this is the reason why I signed up, if there is one. Uh, kids. <laughs> kids. Yeah, it's um, they want to make sure that they don't, uh, and as a new father, I'm sure you can attest to this, but they want to make sure that they don't end up in a situation where they're having to choose between paying the mortgage or putting food on the table. Mm -hmm. And it's, most of our customers, like I said, they have kids, they have, they're earning at least 50% of their household's income, and they live in homes that they own, and they live in, like, suburbs surrounding major cities mm -hmm. so it's not like they're out on the farm in a cheap house they still have a lot of expenses and they don't want to end up in one of those situations where they're having to choose between which of these necessary expenses are more necessary got it so you're saying that for example like if they got into an accident then they would want to be covered by cover so that they wouldn't have to you know make some tough financial choices basically yeah exactly okay Cool. And then, you know, I, I think you guys have, uh, you know, I saw in uh, in some light Googling, you guys had raised $1.5 million seed round in November 2019. So you've been around for a while, but also I feel like, uh, you know, I'm curious about the development of the product, how long the company has been around for. And then maybe if you want to share some early results, you know, whether it's, you know, available, you know, the states that you guys are in or, you know, sort of what the reaction has been, whatever you want to share or comfortable sharing, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, how it, how, how it's evolved, uh, you know, in the past year or two. Yeah, so we started about two years ago. Okay. We entered into a accelerator that was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Techstars, yep. uh, but it, it was a partnership between MetLife and Techstars. So we entered into this accelerator, came out of the accelerator, raised the round that, you're, um, that you saw last year, mm -hmm. almost immediately after leaving the accelerator, and that's when we launched our first iteration of the gig product, which was Rideshare. Got it. We only covered Uber and Lyft drivers, and we only covered Collision. Mm -hmm. We signed up um, a few hundred drivers very quickly, and then COVID hit, and everyone stopped driving. So we went back to the drawing board. We figured out what other solutions people needed outside of just collision. Yeah. What were the other, the other risks that weren't accounted for? And that's why we came up with hospitalization and deactivation. Mm -hmm. Once we came up with hospitalization deactivation we also expanded we worked to include other apps including doordash uh, winolo um, uber eats grubhub caviar uh, there's about 10 different apps that we hmm. currently integrate with in order to verify incomes and then we 
um, relaunched it again this summer, and we have more than doubled what our initial like launch numbers were right. in just one month. So we launched it for um, basically September to March, mm -hmm. and then we launched it again just three weeks ago, and we've already doubled what we saw in those first six months. Oh, so nice. we're very excited about the way that the community is responding to us. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, no, and I mean, I'm always excited when uh, there are companies kind of, you know, innovating with new products or services. But I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of times, you know, there are a lot of companies looking to help uh, drivers. So I think it's always cool to see more work. And, you know, especially when the results are there on your end, you know, I assume it uh, encourages you to keep investing and keep, you know, iterating and improving the product. Uh, so that's always uh, good to see. Um, so I appreciate what you guys are doing, actually. And, you know, I did notice you guys do have a lot of, I guess you, I would call them partnerships. It's, you know, like you mentioned, right, you, I guess you can actually, I don't know if you have official partnerships with the companies, but, you know, you can be working for DoorDash or Grubhub, it sounds like, or Uber or Lyft or any of these companies. And then, like you mentioned earlier, you're partnered with Legal Rideshare and they help with the deactivation. I know I saw Hurdler in there for the mileage tracking. So what's the, uh, what's the story there with all the, uh, the partners? I like it. I'm just curious. <laughs> Yeah, so all of the platforms, we integrate with our APIs in order to pull data in. So if somebody gets into an accident and they would like to replace lost income, mm -hmm. we need to verify how much income they're earning, yeah. and we need to verify that they're actually working for the apps and all of the other things that go into validating a claim. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we integrate with these companies. They all have public APIs that we're able to integrate with, and we're able to pull data in. And so somebody just goes in, they pick the account that they want to link to Cover, say they want to link their Lyft account, they just log in with their Lyft details. It gives us all of their contact information so they don't have to go through and fill out a bunch of forms. It allows us to validate claims, it mm -hmm. allows us to validate income, and uh, it also enables us to stay uh, HIPAA compliant. So if somebody's in, uh, somebody ends up in the hospital, obviously there's some regulatory things that we need to abide by when it comes to uh, distribution of information. Because they're logging in through trusted channels, we're able to maintain communication through a trusted communication channel that enables us to be compliant with the regulatory uh, requirements that we have. Got it. Yeah, no, so it sounds like you make it a lot easier um, there. And I mean, I think the challenge sometimes with products like these is that, you know, especially for drivers, and I, that's why I was I was glad to hear that you guys are getting good sign up numbers. And uh, but I, I think the, the worry that I have sometimes with these is that drivers sort of they don't realize they need it until it's too late. And obviously, with a product like this, I'm assuming you can't sign up once you get into an accident. <laughs> you have to. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately, although you can sign up after you've been deactivated and have us send a deactivation letter for you. Okay, well that's a nice, that's a good thing to know and that's a nice benefit. Uh, but I think yeah. with the products that are sort of, you know, more, I guess you would say compulsory, right? Like I have to file my taxes at the end of every year. So you imagine literally every single Uber and Lyft driver is out there using QuickBooks or, you know, one of these, you know, Hurdler, you know, one of these products out there that I guess one of the actual tax filing software products. So I guess, uh, do you see, what, what are the biggest challenges you see there with a product like yours that like probably every driver should have but um, you know maybe some don't think they need it some think that they can't afford it or you know whatever the reasons uh, that they might not sign up yeah I mean that's a good question so back in at the height of March we tried to launch a um, or we didn't try to launch we launched a COVID protection fund mm -hmm. and it was specifically for gig workers in San Francisco. I think we talked to you about mm -hmm. um, while we were while we were launching this. And the biggest challenge that we had, and what the thing that we learned from doing that, and we implemented in into um, the launch of our gig product, was that people don't know who we are, and so they don't trust us. Mm -hmm. And with anything that is requiring a anything that is covering risk, anything that is there to protect them when things go bad, people are very sensitive to that and they want to make sure that they trust the, trust the company or trust the people, the service that's there to help them. Got it. And so that's why when we, when we relaunched, we went and partnered with, we partnered with you guys, mm -hmm. we partnered with Dylan over at the Rideshare Hub and something like 30 other influencers on YouTube and we said, hey, look through our app 
yeah. tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like, and give an honest opinion to um, to your audience because we pride ourselves on being transparent. We want people to see everything. We actually have, you can see, there's a way for you to go in and see on our, because um, everything is smart contract enabled. It's all built on uh, blockchain and Ethereum. You can go in and see 100% of the transactions that are occurring. Mm. So you can go in and audit the accounts if you wanted to. Um, and when I say you, I mean, Harry, you can do it. Uh, John down the block can do it. Anybody can do it. It's all public knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we really want people to trust us and we want them to, we, we want to be transparent with everything that's going on. Got it. Cool. Um, so I want to shift the conversation a little bit towards, uh, you know, benefits and sort of everything that's kind of going on in the news right now. I'm curious, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, whether, whether you guys think this is good or bad news for you with all the employment, <laughs> or I'm curious to get your take, but, uh, you know, to sort of start the, the benefits conversation, I'm curious, what benefit do you think, uh, matters most to Uber and Lyft drivers and other gig workers? I mean, I guess I'll assume it's, you know, maybe something that they're not getting right now. Well, what's that benefit that you think, uh, matters the most to the most number of people? or has the biggest impact? Oh, that's a good question. I, hmm, I, I think that the benefit that would matter the most is compensation. Mm -hmm. Like every time I'm on the boards, everything I see is they just, they want to be compensated fairly and they don't want to, they don't want to eat the costs for Uber and Lyft's yeah. um, practices. And so if, uh, it would be compensation. You can show compensation in any number of ways. It could be paying for the cost of gas and maintenance. It mm. could be increasing the um, driver's share of fares, or um, it could be covering the cost of health care, or you know any yeah. costs of the risks that they're associated with. But it's it's compensation. It's just putting money back in the driver's pockets. Yeah, I, I like that answer. I mean, I was sort of thinking more of like a healthcare type benefit or something like that. But the challenge with, you know, a healthcare benefit might be that, you know, only 10 to 15% of drivers might say, hey, you know, I don't have health insurance right now. And for those 10 to 15%, it's super important. But uh, for the 85% that have some other option, you know, you can imagine they don't want to pay for that or they don't, you know, they don't want to fight for it if they already have something. Um, so that's interesting. And, uh, you know, right now, obviously, we're seeing a ton of discussion well, we'll post this podcast next week, but I guess the latest news is, you know, now Uber and Lyft are going to stay in California. You know, they're not going to have to pull out, which you literally just broke. And there's this huge employee versus independent contractor debate. So I'm curious at a high level, what's your uh, what's your take on that? And, you know, either from the company's perspective or however you want to share it. Yeah, so I, I'm going to speak on my behalf. I don't we don't have a, uh, a formalized perspective for the company, but on my behalf, from my perspective, there really should be a third classification of employee. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to sound like I'm parroting um, what Dara was saying on your podcast last week, but the gig worker, the concept of a freelancer or a gig worker is really meant as a, a sole proprietorship. It's really meant as somebody who is running a, who's running a business and they're running all the different operations of a business. Mm -hmm. So they're actively seeking clients. They're actively covering HR or you know, they may have general liability insurance. Like they, they cover all of the, all of the different operations. Yeah. The gig community, although they are running their own business, they're outsourcing a large part of that business to these gig apps. Mm -hmm. And so okay. they still have the flexibility. They still have the freedom. They get to choose when they work. They get to, they get to choose um, how they work and which apps they work for. But they're still outsourcing something like 40 to 50 percent of their business to Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and Grubhub, and so they're. Um, and this is one of those places where regulations has not caught up with technology. Mm -hmm. And so you know, government needs to catch up, and they need to create regulations that make sense for gig workers. And I think uh, something like if you work. Um, based on the number of hours a week you work or based on the number of deliveries you do or based on like some sort of a performance-based or mm -hmm. capacity-based metric that helps cover the costs that, you know, a W-2 employee would receive. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. But it, tr telling everyone that they should be a, that 
all the gig workers should be employees. I I think that makes sense in certain circumstances. I know that there's a company called uh, Schlepp up in uh, over in the Midwest that has all of their drivers as employees, and they do that because they want they want to control the quality of the services that they provide, and they have less than a uh, half of a percent negative review rating, like mm-hmm. 99.5% of all of their customers leave positive reviews yeah. um, their experiences. Yeah, and I think that's the one of the issues that a lot of uh, drivers and gig workers have right now is that, you know, a lot of them, you know, we did, just recently did a survey of 700 plus workers, drivers, and 71% said they want to be independent contractors. When you dig down one level, though, I think the big caveat there is that they want to actually be independent, right? They don't want, <laughs> you know, Uber and Lyft to yeah. lower rates and replace it with different bonus systems that sort of make them go certain places, certain times. They want to have more control over setting their own rates and all of, you know, all, all that, you know, kind of the benefits of actually being a pen, independent, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was, when I was driving for Uber and Lyft, I was driving, it was probably a couple of years after you started, mm-hmm. but I was driving and I remember that they went from a, I went from earning something like $1,500 a week to earning um, $800 a week and chasing after the, like the bonuses. And it was just like, it wasn't even something that happened over a period of time. It was overnight. They implemented a new pay structure. Mm -hmm. And three weeks later, I realized I was working more hours, but earning less money. And that's, I think that is what the drivers really want to move away from. Got it. And that sort of arbitrary rate rate changing or I mean rate cutting basically. Um, so uh-huh. how do you think a third way might address those basically that issue you described right there? So I think a third way formalizes the fact that these are I I don't even think independent contractor is a it's not the best term since they're not they're really not independent. Right. <laughs> they're they're dependent on not just They're like on... dependent independent contractors, I guess I would say. Exactly. So they're not and I don't necessarily mean that they're dependent on Uber. They're also dependent on everybody else. Mm-hmm. On everybody else in the class. So you're talking about all the other drivers. Um, I think if you really identify a third way. So one of the things is that when you're dealing with independent contractors, it's um, it's hard to have a uh, a unified bargain mm-hmm. or a unified negotiation. Right. Um, I think it's illegal and, in uh, in most states to collectively bargain as independent contractors. Exactly. And so there's no way for them to stand together and right. voice their opinion unless there is a um, a mass strike. And even that creates a lot of issues mm-hmm. and a lot of challenges. And it's you talk to all the different independent contractors and you could talk to seven of them and they all have seven completely different opinions on whether or not they should be employees. It seems binary, but it, yeah. it has many different shades. And so I think by creating this third class of employee, give them, or a third class of worker, not employee, third class of worker, give them all the flexibility and freedom that they want from being an independent contractor, but also give them some of the protections and the rights, such as the ability to collectively bargain yeah. and argue for, hey, I, they should have the right to set their own wages. They should have the right to determine what's a fair, you know, per mile cost versus a, um, if they want to get paid per mile and they don't want to get paid for their time while sitting in traffic, I say they should have that right. But it's, until you have some form of collective bargaining that's happening between the drivers and the platforms, it's going to be hard for that to happen. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's something I brought up in my interview with Dara last week is that, okay, if Uber launches a benefits fund, for example, that basically equates to paying drivers 5% more, what if they just lower rates by 5% in the future and it kind of immediately offsets that, right? And so I guess in, in the past, I thought, you know, bargaining, I mean, I mean, you, I think you do need some sort of structural or some sort of bargaining, really, like you said, right, to make sure that if you fight for certain changes that they're going to stay. And it sounds 
like it would be tough uh, to get that as independent contractors. But also at the same time, you know, like I don't think, you know, if if drivers were truly 100 percent independent contractors and had like 100 percent control to set their own rates, you know, I often say like if you gave drivers the ability to set their own rates, they might price themselves out of the market. Right. So it's sort of like at a certain point, you also want to you don't want to go too far in the other direction. You have to be careful what you wish for, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I and I think that the benefits fund is an interesting idea just because essentially what the benefits fund tries to do is it tries to fractionalize something that is currently only offered as a whole. Mm -hmm. And there are some interesting companies out there that are doing something similar. I don't know if you've um, heard of Underwing, but they are doing on-demand um, health services. And mm -hmm. so this concept of and really, that's what gig work is, is a fractionalized version of a whole. Yeah. It used to be you were a full-time taxi driver or you weren't a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. And now there's the ability to be a gig, to be a rideshare driver, which is, yeah, yeah some, sometimes you do rideshare, sometimes you go sit in an office. Yeah, that's a good and way to put so, it. Yeah, so if you can create a way to all of the protections and all of the guarantees and all of the benefits, but keep it a fraction similar to how their work is a fraction of you know of all of the work that they do and keep giving them the independence but you know balance that with protections i think that's that would be a very positive way forward yeah it does seem like we're sort of closing in you know it's it's taking a while it's quite slow but it does seem like we're kind of closing in on a potential solution that makes sense you know something like a third way or something like a benefits fund you know i would want the benefits fund to be you know pay drivers a lot more and then definitely i think the key though is to have some sort of collective bargaining so it seems like if you can maybe get you know i don't know that it has to be but i like things like minimum wage a benefits fund you know those are sort of like the things that help drivers pay pay more or make more and then some sort of collective bargaining to uh you know know ensure that that isn't just going to go away one day i think when you get into that space then it sort of starts to be something i could definitely get behind yeah i think there's um so i had a conversation with um i i didn't even have an idea that there was a this possibility for like reclassifying other type of workers i wasn't even thinking about this until um we started our partnership with winolo and they started talking to us about how you can, how Germany has like five or seven different types of worker classifications. Mm. Canada has three or four. Mm. Um, and I started digging into Germany a little bit more. And this is something else I think would be extremely valuable. In Germany, all of the workers for a company, um, they're responsible for putting something like 20% of the board seats, mm. filling 20% of the board seats at that company. Mm, I like and that. so if there was some sort of a, Uber should open up the board, open up the key decision makers to people that are elected by the drivers. Yeah. Give them a voice in how everything is run. And I think that that's, that would move things. Mm. That might be your best idea yet, Nick. I really like that. The more more I think about it, I feel like I've heard about that before, but I, it never clicked in my head. And, you know, I think Uber has launched their, you know, they've had this in the past. There's this driver advisory forum and Lyft has a driver advisory council. And I think depending on who you ask, you know, some people feel that they either do nothing or some people feel that they do something. But it's not, you know, when you when you put someone on the board, you know, when you're one fifth of the board, that's legit. You know, that something like that is like really putting your money where your mouth is. And I think that's... That's sort of what I'm more interested in at this point. I think I want to see actions that really, you know, it's sort of like, hey, this is what we feel, but we're like putting our money uh, where our mouth is. So that would definitely be something that uh, uh, I, th I don't know if that would happen, but I would love to see something like that happen. Yeah, I think it just comes down to a feeling of disenfranchisement. You know, they feel you talk about the gig workers and we talk about how the fact that they go through these rate cuts or these um or these policy changes and they don't get a say in why they're occurring. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like they have a say. They don't feel like they understand. It doesn't feel like it's in their best interest. And from their perspective, it's in the best interest of the stockholders or best interest of the customers or of the Uber employees, but they feel like they're outside looking in and it, it feels disempowering. And so if you put them on the board, if you give them, that type of a, hey, we are partnering with you. This is a partnership. This is, right. in order for us to succeed, all parties have to succeed. That completely changes the dynamic. And I think it would, 
do wonders for not just morale in the community, but also for making sure that they're getting, they're keeping the independence and getting the features and the benefits that they need. Yeah. Yeah. And it is ironic because Uber for legal reasons refers to their drivers always as partners. And a <laughs> funny story I can share is I did a sponsored video with Uber a few years ago when they were launching their new driver app and I thought it was pretty cool. I was like, yeah, it was a project I'll work on them with. And so I went up to San Francisco, interviewed one of their high up, uh, very high up product managers who basically worked on the whole thing. And during the interview, you know, they kept telling us like, hey, make sure you, you have to say partners, you know, and not drivers. And this guy, like at least once or twice, the product manager kept calling them drivers. I'm like, okay, so even the people at Uber don't even call them partners. You know, it's like even the, the actual employees call them drivers. But I would love to see more of a real partnership. And uh, I don't know if we're there yet, but it definitely uh, seems like, you know, we're, we're hopefully getting closer. So I, I thought one final question to end on might be interesting to get your take as far as what do you think would benefit uh, Cover the most if drivers were to become employees, kind of keep things as is or some third way um honestly like there is a this the third way that this benefits fund idea mm -hmm. um it is exactly what we do and we're actually working on large-scale implementations of this for um there is a i can't i can't speak specifics but there's um, a government body that's interested in something similar to this. Cool. Uh, our technology is able to basically take what we're doing on a small scale and do it across an entire platform. Mm -hmm. And we'd be in a good position to assist any platforms that are interested in doing that. Yeah. So the third way would be really beneficial to us. Yeah. Um, but ultimately what's the most beneficial to us is what's the most beneficial to the driver. Mm -hmm. Because if this industry is no longer successful and profitable in three years, then we don't have a product anymore. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and I guess depending on who you ask, right, a full-time driver that wants to be an employee or, you know, maybe the part-time, you know, ish that wants to remain independent, uh, they might have different answers, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Um, okay. Well, really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing all your knowledge about the benefits. I love that you have the actual experience working for all the companies, which is cool. And, uh, you know, now you're bringing that experience to Cover and you guys are launching lots of awesome initiatives and products for drivers. So really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. So if no one has told you thank you lately, I'm telling you thank you, Nick. And uh, you, you will be getting some right your guy swag from me too to, to put my, my thank yous into, uh, into action. So um, thanks. And uh, if people want to learn more about Cover, where should they go? Uh, where can they find you guys? Where can they read more and learn more? They can find us at Cover.ai. And there is a special link that uh, a special rideshare guy link that if they if you click on that link you actually get your first month free if you decide to sign up so cool yeah we've been mentioning it on the podcast it's the rideshareguy.com forward slash get cover and uh, that will get you the first month free which is uh, you know I, I think if anyone knows me or my audience everybody we like free stuff so I appreciate that you guys uh, definitely did your homework all right thanks Nick thank you Harry take care